Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat and grab your Bibles. Let's open up to the book of Esther. Esther, what a great story. Don't you love the book of Esther? There's only two books in all of the Bible that are named after women, and this is one of them. Anybody know the other one? There you go. That's right. Ruth, the only two books in the Bible named after women. Just an interesting little bit of trivia. Ruth was a Gentile married to a Jew, and Esther was a Jewish, a Jewess who married a Gentile. And um, they were both women of, of faith. They were both women of, of great courage and character, and there's just so much to admire uh, in this story uh, that we're gonna see in, in Esther. And, and uh, both of them have something else in common. God used them really to save the nation of Israel. And um, one of them, Ruth, uh, had a son. And, and of course, we know that that son was gonna be part of the line of the Messiah. And we learned about that when we studied that book. And, and uh, that was how she was used by God to save the nation and really the world. Um, Esther saved the nation by the destruction of the enemy. And Haman, you're going to see wicked Haman in this story. <laughs> and um, if this were a movie, if this were Hollywood, whenever Haman enters the scene, the music would change. He'd be the bad guy in the story. And uh, dun, 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 right, you know. And uh, so it doesn't end well from him, for him, but uh, I'll tell you, it was pretty, pretty scary times, uh, I'm sure, for them uh, when this man of great power and influence, uh, being as wicked as he was, uh, was, was breathing threats. Uh, toward God's people, but God protected them. We're gonna see that, as he always has. God's always protected his people and fulfilled his purposes. Uh, remember the Persians came in, and the Medo-Persians, Media and Persia kind of combined, and they, they came in and conquered Babylon in 539 B.C., and uh, the events of the book of Esther, I told you the last couple of weeks that uh, as we looked at Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther, they all sort of combined to make one book at one time. And so you see overlap of the timeline and the events and the people and the themes and um, the events in the book of Esther took place in Shushan or Susa. Uh, you're gonna see at the beginning of uh, this book and that'll sound familiar to you because it also was at the beginning of Nehemiah. And this is where the, the kings in Persia would, would sort of spend their winters. The winter palace was there. And um, the story itself sort of belongs um, chronologically in between uh, chapter six and seven of Ezra if you remember that study. And um, <clears throat> the king who married Esther, now you may, this may confuse you a little bit, so I, I point this out just as an interesting little uh, piece of information, but hopefully also a clarification, because if, if, if you're just reading along and you, you read, um, we're gonna read a name, Ahasuerus, and, um, and then you're gonna, you read in Nehemiah the, the name Xerxes, and the, the king who married Esther was Xerxes. The name Ahasuerus was, was a title, actually, sort of like Pharaoh, the Pharaohs. So Xerxes in history was the same Ahasuerus in this story. And so if you read that and it seems like, oh, what's going on here? It seems like there's a, maybe a contradiction or something. Uh, that explains it. Ahasuerus was just a title, but he was, historically, he was the, the king by the name of Xerxes. And uh, the events of this book are gonna cover about 10 years' time from his third year to his 12th year of his reign. And um, in the midst of this story, it's just a, it's really a, like Ruth, it's a very charming story, a very beautiful story in many respects, and that's full of intrigue and drama, uh, but it, it's, it's hard not to be taken in by the character 
of Mordecai and the character of Esther. So much to admire there. The interesting thing too, if you're, if you're paying attention uh, to the little details, you will notice that there's, there's a conspicuous absence of a particular name in this book. Does anybody know what it is? The name of God. <laughs> That's right, you, not one time do you see mention of the name of God. And yet, every page is full of God. And, and you know, his fingerprints are all over it, and, and he's behind every word. In fact, Matthew Henry, a great uh, preacher of a previous uh, century and a great Bible commentator, he said this, if the name of God is not here, his finger is. And, and it's, it's really true. And, and one of the lessons, the primary themes in this book is, is really the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. And you really do see God's story unfolding in a beautiful way um, as it relates to the nations of the world and, and just how his people have to trust him, have to surrender to his will and, and have to really rely upon God in circumstances where it seems like he's absent. God has never abandoned his people, but, but I don't think we'd be entirely honest with ourselves or with one another if we, didn't, if we didn't admit that there are times where God feels absent or God seems silent. Uh, it, 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 we just sense that, that maybe God uh, isn't there or doesn't care, even though we know better. It, it doesn't always feel that way. And, and that's one of the things I love about this story is it just reminds us and, and it builds my faith to see uh, through the lens of scripture that God is presiding over everything. And you see God's plan unfolding and we can kind of see the beginning from the end. And we have a wonderful privilege today to have the, a biblical vantage point. Not every believer in history has had that, that uh, you know, benefit and that blessing. And so we're especially blessed today to be able to see the entirety of scripture and, and see the beginning f from the end, uh, really from, from, from God's point of view. It's a very unique um, opportunity that we have uh, in, in many ways. And the Jews were struggling, remember? They, they are in captivity. They're, they're struggling in their circumstances. And uh, the Jews were struggling in, in Judah and in Jerusalem. Remember, Nehemiah and Ezra and Zerubbabel had taken them back into the land and they rebuilt the wall and they rebuilt their temple and, and, um, and they needed encouragement. And so God, uh, this story would have been a great encouragement to God's people at a time when they were very tempted, I'm sure, to be discouraged and, um, and forget the greatness of their God and, and, you know, and, and really the sovereignty of their God. And, and we talked about that last week as well in, in Nehemiah, a great theme where he had to always point them back to remember the Lord. And, and so too, as we read this book, even though God's name isn't there, it doesn't mean God isn't there and that God isn't working out his purpose and plan and, and really keeping, remember, throughout our study of the Bible, just on a pretty regular basis, we see allusions to the promises in the covenant of God. Remember, God's weaving together a story that always tie back to the promises. The promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, the promises of his covenant with his people all the way along. And, and they were reiterated through Moses and the law and all of this. And, and this story where it seems like maybe God has forgotten them, he's actually fulfilling his promises. He's still carrying out everything he ever said, even while they're in their captivity. They have walked away from God. They've rebelled and resisted God. And I'll tell you, you know, they don't deserve God. <laughs> to be working things out for their good and his glory, but God is working things out uh, for his good and their glory. And, and again, so much we can relate to today in our own lives. Remember the promise, Genesis 12, one to three. Now the Lord God said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And here, they listen to this because it factors into the story very much. And I will curse him who curses you. Remember that. 
When we get into to learning about Haman, God's fulfilling his promise. And Haman's not in control, God's in control. And he's going to find out uh, on the other side of God's wrath uh, that God will f- fulfill his promises to his people. And he says, and, in, and it says, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So let's pick it up in verse one. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, that was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many Many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold. Good grief, can you imagine? <laughs> couches of gold and silver on mosaic pavement of alabaster turquoise and white and black marble are you getting a picture this is total opulence this is lifestyles of the rich and famous to a whole new level okay and uh he says uh, and they serve drinks in golden vessels each vessel being uh, different from the other with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king in accordance with the law the drinking was not compulsory for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure Hmm. it's it's quite a description and and you see this opulence and yet you're gonna see by contrast to this wealth and this opulence and the riches of this man, you're gonna see really how poor he he is in terms of his character. We keep reading. Queen Vashti, verse nine, also made a feast for the women in the royal palace which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded, okay, hard name, hard name, hard name, hard name. (laughs) All these names, seven eunuchs who searched in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Hmm. Can you imagine? Ladies, on behalf of all men throughout history, I just want to say I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> I read stuff like this, and I just think, it's hard to be a woman in this world. And it, it always has been hard in, in many respects. And, and I read stuff like this, and I think, God has to give you ladies a lot of grace, because there have been a lot of turkeys in history that have just not been good to women. And so, anyway... Just had to get that out. Uh, But I'll tell you, the poverty of this man's character, you know, he's showing off all of his glory and his extravagance, and he takes six months to do it. You do the math, 180 days. I mean, this is a big time party, and it's just all, just this obnoxious display of his pride and his, his power. I was thinking this week, you know, it seems like a long time, but at the end of six months, he had nothing else to share. You know, really, he, he's so poor. And I, I was thinking by contrast to what Ephesians, for example, says in the New Testament, where Paul just trots out this long list of all of our riches in Christ. Blessed is them, and just blessed, 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 and all these blessings that we have in Christ. And you know what? We're not even, it's gonna take an eternity to talk about it. It's gonna take an eternity to enjoy it. It's, 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 it's not gonna be over in six months. And so what looks like a big deal to man, it, it's just, it, it's just a, a, a mere pittance compared to what we have in Christ. He's a poor man. 
Paul says, Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the, in the saints. It's amazing. We're Christ's inheritance. He purchased us and, and we belong to him. And, and yet, it's also true, he's our inheritance. And it's just such an incredible thing to think about. And, you know, it says this guy... He entertained his guests with wine in abundance. And I'll never forget the first time I was invited to Pastor Chuck's house. My wife and I were newlyweds. We were new in the church. He invited us into his home. We had so much fun that night. We went away just, all we did is just hang out in fellowship, eat some, a, a delicious dinner, and play dominoes. And this is going to sound kind of weird, but we'd never had an experience like, quite like that before, a church experience like that, and a, a, an experience with a pastor like that. And so it was the weirdest thing because we went away and we thought, okay, let's just kind of assess this night. What did we do? We played dominoes with our pastor. <laughs> and yet we went away feeling so full and so rich there was something so sweet about that experience and a fellowship. We'd never had that kind of experience. And we thought, you know, we grew up in a world where, where to have fun, people had to get drunk. You know, people had to be crazy and do things, you know, all in the name of having a good time. And then later they just lived with shame and regret over what they did. And that's kind of what I was thinking of when I was reading this. And here this guy... They just, they drink their wine in abundance and, and they all get just totally plastered and that's their idea of a good time. Well, we're gonna see. It just ends up being a shameful kind of a thing. Reminds me of the proverb, listen to this, Proverbs 21, 20 verse one. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler and whoever's led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs 23, 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. You have, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? I, that's a pretty apt description of, of what alcohol does in a life. Now understand, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And we all struggle in many ways. We all struggle with things, and, and my heart goes out. Um, I grew up in a family where we have just, I, I was just surrounded by this, and it's only the grace of God that rescued me out of it. But I'll tell you what, there's just nothing good that comes out of a life like that. Nothing good comes out of a, a, a the idolatry of that sort of lifestyle, it just brings us into bondage and, and it brings shame. Paul said, what benefit do you derive from those things of which you're now ashamed? <laughs> and, and it's so wonderful to come to Christ, to turn that over to the Lord and begin, as the scripture says, to be continually being filled with the Spirit. Not to be drunk with dissipation, but to be filled with the Spirit. And, and to be in a relationship with the Lord. It's just, it's, it's so far superior. Um, th there's no shame associated with it. And, um, and Queen Vashti, her response was pretty impressive. She, she, didn't, she didn't do it. So in their drunken craziness, they go, hey, I got a good idea. Let's have the queen come in wearing her crown. The implication is that's all she'd be wearing. You know, it was their version of a nudie bar. Okay, let's just, this is, this is what, what seemed like a good time. She refused to attend the feast. And someone rightly said she lost her crown, but she kept her dignity. I love it.
Oh, man. <laughs> and he gets so ticked off about this because, because it really, uh, it made him the fool, you know, to be turned down by the queen, by his wife in front of all of these guests, these royal guests. Oh, man. Uh, he did some foolish things. You know what I did this week? As I thought about this, it just struck me. <clears throat> I thought, this guy was just filled with pride. And I was thinking about, in this story alone, just this little chapter, as I thought about it, I thought, I, I came up with a top 10 list of, of the fruit of pride. And I'll bet you could add to it if you went and spent some time thinking about it. But listen to this. I'm not going to really develop each of these things, but, but these are 10 things that just came to my mind as I meditated. Here's what, what you see the fruit of pride is. Number one, loss of good judgment. Loss of good judgment. This guy lost his ability. He's a king in a position of authority, and, and he's in a position to make good judgments and righteous judgments and, and that's how you're supposed to carry out authority but he lost his ability to make good judgments and that's what happens that's what pride does foolish behavior how many regrets do we have in life where we look back and we see you know I just played the fool and it was it was because of pride I did this just uh, this morning with, with my wife, I, I, I said something that was just stupid and careless, and I didn't even realize it, and I looked over, <laughs> bless her heart, she was literally praying. She was working through it. And I looked over and I saw her, and, 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 and she was just, her eyes were closed, and she just was kind of praying. <laughs> and it totally convicted me. I realized at that moment because I thought, what is she doing? And I realized the Lord said, she's praying for you, knucklehead. <laughs> I just, I realized all of a sudden she was walking in the spirit because she was tempted, I'm sure, to respond in the flesh because I was in the flesh and I just said something dumb. And she was praying through it. It was such a convicting thing. And, and my pride made me behave in, in a foolish way. And I, you know, and, and of course, I just, I just, and then the battle's on, you know? <laughs> when you are convicted, you want to start justifying yourself. And I'm thinking, well, if she wouldn't have done that. And, you know, if she hadn't have said this, you know? And I, I wanted to help her see her sin. The problem was there's this massive log in my own eye. I, I just, it was hard to find the sliver in her eye, you know? And I, and so I just finally, I just, it was like the, the Lord said, John, would you, come on, man, don't just make this worse. Just, humble yourself and go <laughs> so I kind of sauntered over to her and I just said honey I'm sorry okay I said tell me what you're thinking I know I need to hear it you know <laughs> and we worked through it and we prayed through it and stuff it was just one of those moments and I, I, I I'm sure you have them too but I I just was reminded, you know, when God's teaching me something in the Word, He usually is working it out in a practical way, so I have good illustrations. <laughs> John, here's how you fail at this. And, and I realized it was just pride. That's all it was. It was just pride. And I, and I was a fool. But, you know, God is so gracious and so patient, and I'm thankful that He, that he gives me, gave me a, a wife who can just kind of pray through things, and, and she didn't make a big deal of it, but it was convicting for me, and I, I, needed, to, I needed to deal with it, you know, and, and so. Uh, another thing, number three, fear of man. Fear of man. This guy was doing the stuff he was doing because he wanted the approval of man. That's all. He wanted everybody to think he was a big deal. Well, he wasn't a big deal, and he had to be brought low. Pride will, pride will make you bow to the idol of approval. That's what it does, fear of man. Selfish anger. He's going to respond, we're going to see in a minute, he's going to respond in his anger. It's just, again, pride. Lustful behavior. You think, well, aren't those kind of two different things? Well, in, in some ways, but really at the root of, of lustful behavior is pride. It really is. It's, it's pride. And mistreatment of others. That's another thing. 
So what are we up to? One, two, three, four, five, six. Mistreatment of others. Others. Seven. We're going to see here in a minute. Bad advice. The guy goes and gets bad advice. He, he looks for people who are going to tell him what he wants to hear so he can go do what he wants to do. Again, bad advice. And that leads to bad decisions. And then number nine, loss of relationships. That's the problem. When you bow to idols, usually the first thing you sacrifice at the, at the altar of an idol is relationship. For sure, relationship to God and very often also relationship to others. And then the last thing I noted is loss of respect and a good name. The guy was humiliated, and I'm sure everybody just kind of, he just, they probably just looked at them and kind of blushed on his behalf and thought, you really blew it, buddy. And just loss of respect in the eyes of other people. That's the fruit of pride. And let's, let's see what I'm talking about here. Uh, verse 12, it says his, his, his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this is the king's manner toward all who knew the law and justice. So he, he asks a bunch of his, his cronies there. And, and he says, what shall we do? Verse 15, to Queen Vashti, according to the law, because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the king's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report. When they report, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to brought in before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they've heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. <laughs> so they got their little good old boys club going there, and, and <laughs> they realized we got we to gotta keep these women in line, you know, and uh, things are going to get out of control here pretty quick, and we just can't have all the women wearing the pants in the family, you know, and, and so they just, that's kind of their attitude. It's just, it's, it's chauvinistic, it's arrogant, it's just total stupidity, and, and, but that's, again, that's where pride will lead, to you to just do some really boneheaded things. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out uh, from him and let it be recorded in the law of the, Mede, Perds and the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who's better than she. And when the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes and the king did according to the word of Memucan. And he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in his own script, to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. So you can see how that top 10 list fits in there. It's just like, just one more step followed by another step going down the wrong road and it just kind of Spirals out of control. And uh, you know what's interesting as you come into chapter two, <laughs> after the alcohol wears off and after you come to your senses, there's oftentimes regret. It said, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, <laughs> what she had done and what had been decreed against her. And so, you know. He, he starts to reflect on things, and the implication here to me seems to be that he was kind of down about it. An interesting little historical footnote um, <clears throat> that I came across, I did not know this. Um, according to the Roman historian Herodotus, at this time the Persian Empire comprised more than half the then known world. And between chapters one and two, Ahasuerus made his historic attack on Greece with an army of five million men suffering a terrible defeat in the famous battles of, and you, some of you historians will recognize this, the battles of Thermopylae and Salamis in 480 BC. And so, uh, so what's happened is he comes back from this terrible defeat and he's kind of bummed out. And in his sadness, he's, everything's, I mean, he's lost his wife, he's lost his, uh, he's lost some battles, uh, he probably lost his dog and his pickup truck, it's like a country song here, I mean, he's just, <laughs> he, 
he's, he's just kind of down in the dumps. And so they come in, and you know, we can't have the king being down. And so <clears throat> uh, the king's servants attended and said, uh, um, let, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Oh, there's a bright idea. So <laughs> they decide to have, you know, uh, a Miss Universe contest, basically. And they're going to go, you know, find some pretty ladies for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Higai, the king's eunuch custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given to them. Let young women who please the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. The thing pleased the king, and he did so. So they come up with this idea, and he says, okay. <laughs> He's not, they don't have to twist his arm at all. And so they carry out this plan, and um, that's what they do. And um, it's very, very interesting how it all comes down. But here's where it starts to become very, very interesting, because verse 5, we learn about a guy named Mordecai. Now, he was born in captivity, okay? So he was of the tribe of Benjamin, a son of Kish, and he was... Of part of his father and grandfather were of those who had uh, been carried away by Babylon into captivity. So he was raised there uh, like Esther in Babylon. And we're told in verse 7, Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. Uh, the young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So we see here, uh, we're introduced to these two characters and uh, such a beautiful light is cast upon them uh, for her, Liz, literally, physically, she was, she was really pretty. She was just a beautiful young woman. And Mordecai um, was an attractive guy himself in terms of his character. And he was a guy that stepped up to the plate to take care of his cousin. And he was a bit older, no doubt, but, but he was going to take care of Esther on behalf of his brother who had died and his brother's wife. And so uh, he raises her, and uh, boy, as the story goes on, you're going to see he did a good job. <laughs> he raised her well because she's quite a gal. And, um, and so we're going to see here, we see the, this, um, this whole kind of story unfolds where they go, and they, they look for these beautiful young virgins, and, uh, and it says in verse 9, the young woman pleased him, and she obtained favor. So this guy, Haggai, who was kind of in charge of, of this uh, search uh, on behalf of the king, he comes across Esther and he says, we'll take her. Uh, she's uh, the one. And he moves her to the best place in the house of women. And uh, it says in verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. So one of the things we see of Mordecai is he was wise. He was a wise man. And he said, hey, just kind of keep this on the down low. You know, remember, they're in captivity. The Jews, you know, um, are not being treated well. Um, you know, they're slaves. And so he says, don't, don't, don't tell them who you are. Um, it's, it's sort of like the biblical, the Bible's version of Cinderella, you know. I mean, if they knew that she was who she was, uh, you know, she, she wasn't up to the royal standards in terms of her place in society. And so... Uh, and every, so, and, and then verse 11, I love this. Every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of El Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. So he was a guy that was uh, looking out for his girl, you know. He wanted to make sure that she was being protected. She was being taken care of. And so she goes through 12 months of preparations and, and um, you know, this beauty regimen, so to speak, to kind of prepare her to go into the king. And again, ladies, I apologize. This guy has to be hard for ladies to read, you know, because, um, you know, women were like property. That's the, was really the way it was in that culture. And so, uh, you know, they, they would take, basically, when, it, when, when their number was called and it was time to go into the king, they would go and spend the night with the king. And the next morning, they go back to the women's quarters. And, and it was probably that they would never be called back again. You know, that's, that's the way it was. In her case, though, it says, um, it says in verse uh, 14, she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Well, 
In fact, uh, he does call for her again. And what's really interesting, again, we see something into the character of Esther. Um, Verse 15, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And so she found favor. And you know, you start to get the sense as the story's unfolding, she wasn't just beautiful outwardly, she was beautiful inwardly. You know, she, she was, was obtaining favor with people. Uh, everybody just liked her, you know, because of her character. And uh, she, she, you know, God's hand, of course, was upon her. Um, and you just see this, the, the providence of God, his plan unfolding. And um, now, interesting thing happens. At this point in the story, um, Esther, again, we're told in verse 20, didn't reveal her family or her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. So she was obedient to uh, Mordecai. And, um, and Mordecai's out there outside the king's gates. And again, he's checking each day. Well, it comes to his attention that there's a plot on the king's life. So, verse 22, the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. When an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on the gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So while all this stuff is going on publicly for Esther, behind the scenes privately is this plot to overthrow the king or take the king's life. And, uh, and God is orchestrating all of these things. And it's all important because it's gonna be, it's setting up this, uh, uh, this conflict really that's gonna take place and Esther's gonna be used by God um, in a way to save his people. And so we come into chapter three and this is where the music changes. This is where the lighting changes and enter bad guy Haman. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him and all the kings who were within the king's gate, bowed down and paid homage to Haman for so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow down and pay homage. And so... Uh, Again, just like the king himself, this guy is so full of himself, so filled with pride. And um, we're gonna see him ascend to power, but he's a wicked man. He is a wicked man. Um, I love this verse in Job, Job 24. Do you not know this of old, since man was placed on earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment? Isn't that a great verse? So you see these things, and I think that's important to realize because in our lives, we can feel like, man, it seems like the wicked prosper and it seems like good people suffer and we really struggle with that dilemma and we're not alone. The Bible addresses that. Go read Psalm 73 sometime. And, and that's the whole point of that Psalm. It just seems like the, the, the good guys lose and the bad guys win. And, and, but the Bible always says, wait a minute, you got to take the long view. You got to pull back. You got to look at the end. You got to look at this from an eternal perspective. And listen, we can be sure of this: the bad guys don't win in God's story. Uh, and and yet in this life, it is true that even good, quote unquote, good people suffer. And so this guy comes on the scene, and he's going to create some suffering in the lives of people, some some fear and some threats, and. Um, and uh, so the, the king promotes this evil guy and, um, and he even approves uh, really his wicked plan. And I imagine that the Jews at that time were asking, you know, why has God allowed this to happen? Do you ever do that? <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself, why does God allow this to happen to me? And why does God allow so much evil in this world? Well, it's certainly not because God uh, doesn't care or God's not in control. Um, sometimes God allows short-term evil to bring about long-term good. That's just a, a simple truth. We don't like that, 
but uh, I don't think we're going to be complaining in heaven because God is still good and God is still God. He's in control and he's working these things. And someone once said, what, when men do not allow him to rule, he overrules <laughs> and he always accomplishes his purposes. That's part of what Paul meant when he said God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This, this thing may not be good, but God's working it together with a host of other things, and in the end, it's gonna be good. I've used the illustration before, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it really is true. You know, a lot of things that were, you know, when you're baking something, there's a lot of individual ingredients that you would never eat in and of themselves, but there's something about mixing it together and cooking it just right over time, and, and all of a sudden you smell, the smell comes from the kitchen, you're like, oh, that's good, you know? But, you, but if you were to eat a, a spoonful of, you know, salt or flour, it would not be good, and yet so often that's a picture of our lives. There's just things that don't taste very good by themselves, but put together under God's masterful touch, it comes out really, really good. And everything about Haman, again, filled with pride, and, uh, and, and he hated the people of God. Uh, but, though, but, but we're going to see that his plan is going to backfire, and, um, and he's, he's going to basically, uh, he's going to try to destroy God's people, and in the process, he's going to be uh, destroyed. So, um, verse 3. Uh, three or, or verse two, we read that, that, that Mordecai wouldn't bow to him, but the, the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress, transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, underline that, the enemy, do you know that, that, that the enemy is so relentless, he comes daily? It reminds me of the story of Joseph. When, remember when he was being tempted uh, by Potiphar's wife and, it said, and she, she, she was after him daily, just relentless. And that's often the way it is with, with spiritual attack and the enemies of God and God's people is they, it happens daily. But I love this, and it says, he would not listen to them. And uh, Mordecai had this, this principle understood. Um, he was a man under authority, but, but, he's, but he understood this idea that um, I obey God rather than man. You know, I can obey man to a, po a point, but, but if man tells me to do something that is in violation of what God has said, then what God says supersedes what man says. And, and you know, Mordecai knew, you don't, you don't bow down to anybody except the Lord. God will, there will be no other gods before him, as the commandments say. Um, Proverbs 6, 16 to, 8, or to 19, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. And that's pretty much in spades describes what Haman is up to. And um, so, amazing Amazing. We come to chapter uh, four, and um, we're going to see that Esther agrees to help uh, the Jews. Uh, in chapter three, basically, they pass this this law. Haman, um, you know, got a law passed that that was uh, against the Jews, and Esther comes along, and Mordecai says, "You know what? Uh, you're going to have to help." You know, you're the one in the position. You have the king's ear. You're in this position of, of privilege and power, and our people are going to be destroyed. We need you. And, um, and I just, I love this. We come into chapter uh, 4. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every providence where, province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So because Mordecai wouldn't bow down, Haman puts it, you know, gets the, key, the king to sign this decree that basically the Jews, uh, who Mordecai was a Jew, uh, I'm just going to not only kill him, I'm going to kill all the Jews, you know, I'm going to kill all the people, and, and uh, he just went nuts with this, 
And uh, so he's pretty, uh, you know, pretty bummed out about this. And, and yet he still has to be very careful because if you come into the king's presence and you're sad, uh, that's going to be a problem. And so the fasting and weeping and all of that, um, that was just part of how they expressed their, their sorrow in Jewish culture. And uh, they, they did that publicly, and that was going to be unacceptable to this pagan king. And so he comes to, the word gets back to Esther, hey, you know, your, your cousin out there is <laughs> uh, pretty upset. And so she, she inquires as to why, and, and the story comes back. He says, well, here's why. And... Um, Mordecai tells all that happens to him, verse 7, and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead for him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Hester, Esther the words of Mordecai. And this is where it just, it's, it's such a cool part of the story because she gets the news, and then Mordecai, verse 13, it says, and Mordecai told them to, to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all those who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Man, don't you just love this gal? She is so impressive. And so, so Mordecai expresses his grief. And we just see how a crisis can reveal the character of a person. And um, even though he was in danger, even though Esther was in danger, the way they respond in this crisis is very instructive for us. They weren't just going to stand by and do nothing. And you know, they could have. They could have. But they faced it head on. I love these words. And if I perish, I perish. How convicting it would have been to, ha to hear the words of Mordecai. Hey, look, Esther, I know this is scary, uh, but fear God rather than man, basically. Because here's the deal. God's gonna save his people, and you're either gonna get to be a part of it or not. And you don't wanna be found opposing God. You don't wanna be in a position where you're not doing what God gives you to do because the fact of the matter is for all you know that's why God brought you here you know do you ever wonder why God has you in a situation that you're in you know a lot of times we don't like the circumstances that we're in but the fact of the matter is God has us there for a reason and um, and sometimes we can miss the opportunity God gives us one of the things that the Lord has taught me in, when I'm going through trials is to redeem the time because, you know, God's still, God's gonna be no less good and no less faithful, but I can miss out on the good things that God wants to do. How many miracles do we miss out on in the Christian life simply because we don't redeem the time and cling closer to the Lord than ever when we're in the midst of trials and circumstances that we don't understand? We start charging God with being unfair. We start questioning God's goodness. We, we start complaining and whining and, and we just lose heart and, and our faith, it's like our faith is shipwrecked because we just, we've lost perspective. Have we forgotten who we are? Have we forgotten our story, our incredible story? How many more miracles does God have to work for his people to convince us that he really does have our best in mind? It's nice to read stories of other people's faith, you know. That's so inspiring until I go through my own hard time. Well, wait a minute. What happened to inspiration? <laughs> Why aren't you so inspired by their story anymore, you know? Well, it's different, you know. They didn't have to go through this. <laughs> yeah, that's how everybody feels when they go through this, you know. It always feels like this is something special or unique or different or especially hard, and, and yet... You know, all, all trials are hard. 
You know, it's, it's all going to be tested, and faith that isn't tested isn't really faith. I'm not trivializing, you know, the, the, the process we go through. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm wanting to help us have this perspective, you know, keep it in perspective. And God's doing something. We want to be a part of what God is doing. And remember, one of the, one of the great principles in Scripture that helps us to trust God is remembering that that he is someone that is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Remember, Jesus suffered. He came into this world. He doesn't expect us just to suffer and deal with it. He says, hey, I understand. I came into this world. I suffered too. And, um, and he knows how we feel. Hebrews ten nineteen. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, <clears throat> which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so uh, we understand God, God himself has suffered. And what an opportunity for her. And, and a picture, really. You remember in, in Romans where Paul says I, that we're to lay down our lives and be a living sacrifice? Don't you think that Esther's a pretty good picture of that? She's a living sacrifice. She's willing to go into the king. And, and so that's what we see next is the venture of Esther as she goes in and, you know, and, and Malachi really challenges her faith and and, uh, and she decides to, to do what, what he's told her to do, and she does the most extraordinary thing. It happened on the third day that Esther put her royal, on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So you you got the scene in your mind. He's sitting there on his throne and he's in his big palace or house and he looks out across the way and there's a courtyard out there. And all of a sudden he's like, is that Esther? And she's just standing there quietly waiting to be ushered in. Just saying, you know, and that was a real, uh, in that culture, Apparently, you could die if you weren't summoned, if you weren't invited. You can't just drop by and bing, bong, hey, I just dropped by. <laughs> you know, you're, you can't just waltz into the king's presence. And so it was, it was quite a step of faith. Well, you know the story. She comes, he, he, he says, what do you wish, Queen Esther? And it'll be given to you up to half the kingdom. And she says, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared. And, and the king said, bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. And so the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther prepared. And of course, at the, at the banquet, you know, she, she didn't come right out and say what was going on, but she was kind of letting the... Uh, the uh, um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The suspense build. Yes, thank you. Kind of letting that build. And, uh, and, and she basically, she says, he says, you know, tell me again, up to half the kingdom. And he says, and she says, well, how about we have another banquet, you know, and come to the, the one that I'm going to have tomorrow kind of a thing. And, okay, you know, and uh, I guess the man's way to, a, the way to a man's heart is through his tummy. Is that how it goes, ladies? <laughs> So she, she talks him into coming back again, and uh, she sets she she basically sets the trap for for Haman. Haman, in the midst of it, he goes home and he's again so filled with pride, and he's talking to his wife, and he's in, hey, you know, guess what the king did? He, you know, honored me in this way and that way, and. And, uh, but he was still so ticked off because every time he went by Mordecai, you know, he waltzes out of the palace and he's just been promoted and he's got all this favor with the king, but he just can't let it go that this Jew over here won't bow down to him. He's, he's just, it's not enough. It's never enough. That's the thing. Pride can never be satisfied. Well, the king in verse, in chapter six, he can't sleep. And uh, so he says, he's got in some, he says, hey, bring the book of the records of the Chronicles. And they were read before the king. And it was found uh, written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done. And so remember the plot that had happened earlier? Well, Mordecai just 
you know, never got acknowledged for that. And so, again, you see God's providence all of a sudden. You know, God wants to talk to this king, and so he can't sleep. And I've had that happen before where I can't sleep, and I've learned to just stop and say, okay, God, what do you want to say? <laughs> I can't sleep anyway. I might as well listen. And uh, sometimes God talks to us in the night hours. Well, anyway, he goes and he, he reads the record, and sure enough, uh, he, he discovers this thing that had been overlooked. About that time, Haman comes in and he says, Haman, what should the king do, you know, to give honor to, uh, you know, this person who has done something good to him? And he's thinking, of course, because all he thinks about is himself is, well, you know, bring out the royal steed and put your robe on him and parade him through town. And, you know, he's thinking it's all going to be him. And can you imagine the next words out of the king's mouth, great idea, go do it for Mordecai. Are you kidding me? I hate that guy, you know, and, and it was just, just the, the worst thing ever, but that's what he has to do. So total, total humiliation, and you know as the story goes, Haman, he, he was so ticked off, and his wife suggested that he build gallows for this guy. And so he's got gallows there just waiting to hang Mordecai on, and... Uh, and, well, I don't want to ruin the story. So, so he, he kind of muscles through this humiliation of parading through the streets, uh, Mordecai. And then now they go back to this, this uh, second meal with Queen Esther. And uh, in chapter 7, all of a sudden the plot is thickening. And so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Queen Esther answered and said, if I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given at my petition and my people at my request. For we've been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to the Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? He's totally oblivious that this whole plot's been going on in the background, right? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Hey, I'll bet Haman choked on his pork chop at that moment, you know, because he's thinking, ah, no, this isn't good. And so Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And so it just goes from bad to worse because the king has to kind of process this. He gets up and walks away in the other room. And meanwhile, Haman starts tripping over himself, trying to get the queen to, you know, not go through with this here, you know, uh, revelation to the king. In the process, he kind of falls upon her on the couch the king walks in and that's all she wrote it says they just brought the guys brought in the bag and put it over his head and king didn't even say anything you know that's just terrible it's just it's a horrible thing but it was a great thing and again god's uh it'd be a tough way to go and so uh he says uh uh, the word left, and the word left the king's mouth. As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, uh, said to the king, look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. The king said, hang him on it. So they played a little game of hangman, and uh, Haman, Haman got what he deserved. And so chapter Eight, where we, we read that Esther saves, basically, Esther saves the Jews. And the way it works is uh, the, the edict couldn't be reversed, you know, and, and the, the kings, the law of the Medes and Persians, it was going to, Persians, it was going to happen uh, that, you know, people were, there's going to come that day where the people were going to go out and kill the Jews. And basically, he could, usher, he, he could, he could authorize another edict that allowed the Jews to defend themselves. And, um, and that's what we see uh, taking place in the rest of the story. But there's one more thing I want to point out to you. Um, oh, it is in this chapter, in chapter 8. I want you to see Esther exposes the enemy, and in the process she saves her, her own life and her people's life. And, uh, but, but the thing that's cool is 
Uh, I never saw this before, but one commentator pointed out, I thought this was really cool. Can you see, he said, an illustration of how God solved the sinner's plight. You were under condemnation because of the law of sin and death. Okay, pull back and think of the gospel. Think of the New Testament and, and our understanding of how God deals with sin. Here there was a law proclaimed upon God's people. It was a death sentence. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God didn't revoke that law. He obeyed it. He sent his own son to die for our sins and to bring the law uh, in the law of the spirit of life. Amazing. And any sinner who believes the message and trusts the Savior will receive everlasting life. And, and the king ends up sending out couriers to, to proclaim the word in all the provinces. You, you can fight for your lives. You, you can defend yourselves. And basically the message was, you've been condemned, but you don't have to die. Isn't that cool? That's exactly like us. We've been condemned because of sin, but we don't have to die. Those people could have just sat there and said, yeah, well, we don't really believe it, and they would have died. But, but they, they were given the authority to believe the word of the king and in the process save their, be saved. And, and so too. And there's a cool picture here. You and I get to be the couriers of this message. We get to go out into the world isn't this cool? We get to go out into the world and proclaim the king's message. And we get to see people who otherwise are condemned to die because of the law, because of the pronouncement of God's law on sin. We get to proclaim, you don't have to die. You can be saved. And all they have to do is believe. All they have to do is believe. Well, chapter uh, nine, basically, tells us that they did just that and they destroyed their enemies, the Jews destroyed their enemies and then they, they, they celebrate their victory. This is where we get the Feast of Purim and, um, and it's just a time, it's basically kind of their Thanksgiving day in, in, in the Jewish uh, culture uh, because they, if you think about this, this was just like so many other times throughout the Bible where we see Satan is behind the scenes wanting to destroy God's people. The entire Jewish race could have been destroyed. Could have been destroyed. Just like in Moses' time, the Pharaoh could have destroyed all of God's people, but God took Moses and saved them. And this is yet another one of those. You fast forward into the New Testament. Remember what did Herod do? He tried to kill all the babies to kill the line of the Messiah. Satan was behind that. Could have destroyed God's, God's gospel story and plan. But again, in God's providence, in his wisdom, in his sovereign power, he's getting it done. He's bringing to pass his plan to bring a savior into the world. And um, it's, just, it's just really uh, an amazing story. And um, so... I'm gonna stop there, that's the book of Esther. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna close out with uh, communion. And um, you know, it's, this, this story um, is just a reminder to me that God is a savior. And, and when we celebrate communion, that's what we're celebrating, right? We're just celebrating that, uh, that God rescues sinners by his amazing grace. And the story of Esther, like so many, you know, so any book of the Bible really, is you see this, this theme of grace just coming through, saved by grace. So let's celebrate that together um, as we take communion. I'm gonna read the scripture and then you can come up. I just, what just happened? <laughs> Did you bump something else? <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, the... The scripture in Matthew 26, um, I just lost it, or did it go? Okay, here we go. And as, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you, new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
That's such a cool thing to think about. We're gonna get to drink together with the Lord in the kingdom. But for now, as we drink from it, he wants us to remember his death till he comes. Lord, thank you for your grace, your saving grace. Thank you that you that you not only save sinners, but you send sinners. We get to go into this world and proclaim a message of hope and salvation to people who are captive, who are condemned. There's a death sentence upon them because of sin. Uh, But this story reminds us that we get to be your couriers. We get to be ambassadors of Christ. And even as we get to celebrate the cross tonight and, and that you have saved us from sin, we get to go out and proclaim that same gospel message that sinners can be saved. And, and though sin itself, the wages of sin is death, we can be rescued and we can experience new life in Christ. Thank you for rescuing us and loving us. Thank you for your amazing grace that saves us. And Lord, for giving us the privilege of going into a lost world and sharing this message of grace and hope. In Jesus' name, amen.